For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and their iniquities, the word iniquity referring to lawless deeds, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Isn't that an awesome declaration by the Almighty God? You know, in the Old Covenant, he said, if thou wilt, I will. It was a conditional clause. But here it's a declarative statement. He's saying, I will. That's God's sovereign act. It doesn't depend on us. It's his power being manifested. You see, God is doing something here and bringing about something that could not be brought about any other way. It's his divine act of salvation. And he's telling us about a covenant. This is the covenant that I will make. Not an old covenant now, a new one. I will. And that was a prophecy. And you know what? By the time this was written, he already did through Jesus Christ. Let's look at this. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. How do we get this? How do we enter in? Notice something. It says, we're of the Holy Ghost. Backing up a verse. The Holy Ghost also is a witness. Did you ever hear that terminology, the witness of the Spirit? And the, the Lord is with us in such a way that When we behold the things going on in this world, some call it discernment, but really the understanding that we have is by revelation. The Lord shows us things. You and I never figure it out. When things are spiritually discerned, they have to be revealed. You understand what I'm saying? None of us are intelligent. As a matter of fact, it's not even intelligence that that makes it work. If it were, none of us would... There's nobody on earth that would be intelligent enough to figure this out. Because it is the act of God in the spirit bringing forth truth that you and I would be incapable of otherwise. It is revealed to us. What we have is shown to us by God. He lays it out for us. So really we're all in the same position here. There's nobody that of their own volition, of their own abilities, could bring forth any good thing. So we trust in the Lord to reveal it to us. But what's awesome about this, he calls it a covenant, which is an agreement. And of course, it was sealed in his blood, shed on the cross of Calvary. But notice what he does about it. He says, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Now, when you think about how wonderful this is, God literally, when he fills you with the Holy Ghost, when he calls you to repentance, when you obey the gospel, God writes something in your heart. I can't think of too many times that I know of where God himself actually wrote. I know he inspired his prophets and his apostles to write scripture. But I do know that God wrote in stone on Mount Sinai. God wrote on the wall of Belshazzar's palace. Jesus wrote on the ground when they brought the adulterous woman and tried to condemn her. And she ended up justified and the accusers ended up condemned. Isn't it awesome how the Lord works? But Jesus wrote down on the ground in the sand. You know, the first time it was up on a mountain, the next time in a palace, and finally on the dirt. Because God himself condescended to men of low estate. Do you see the progression? The top of Sinai, in the palace of the heathen, 
Talk about a palace of the heathen. I'll tell you what, we got a White House that qualifies for that right now. I'm going to make a statement, and I don't want it to be misunderstood as racial. Because some people will do that to you, and if they do, they're being intellectually dishonest. But I find it amazing that we have a president, and I'm talking about character here, not color. So I want you to understand that. Those of who know me understand how I feel. That I, I absolutely have no uh, ill feelings toward any race of people. Any can be saved. All right? I just have, too bad I have to say all those things before I make a statement like this. But I'm looking at something prophetically here. It's amazing how we right now have a president who will openly say he is half uh, African. And, of course, the other half, he claims is, that he is white. So he is what you would call a half-blood prince. Have you noticed the title of the latest Harry Potter movie? Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. All right? There's nothing wrong with somebody being half of this and half of that, or however you want to divide it up in fractions or percentages. I have no problem with that. I find that this man, however, and looking at his character and where he came from, and you can trace his roots back to Edom. And the same thing with Rahm Emanuel, back to Edom. And, of course, Edom means red, descendants of Esau. And then you look at what red means. Red used to mean something. Back when I was a, a, a teenager and so forth, if you were a red, you were a communist. We've got a communist in the White House. He's doing everything a communist would do. One step at a time in a progression, little by little, so people don't really pay much attention to it. They're distracted anyway by so many things. Right now, they're distracted by the death of Michael Jackson and Farrah Fawcett and Ed McMahon and Gail Storm. Boy, they're dropping like flies, aren't they? But they take advantage of these distractions to pass this weird legislation, which they did. 300 pages, 3 o'clock in the morning, throw it down and say, there, we're going to vote. If somebody handed you 300 pages at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, we're voting here now, can you speed read that? No. Not one person read it. And they voted. How could you? But see, this sort of thing goes on all the time. Jesus, when it came to take Jesus, and by the way, they didn't take him, he went with them. No man took his life, he laid it down for us. But you know, when they came out to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus looked at them and said, I was openly with you. In the temple, in the city, I was there, right out in the open, and nobody laid hands on me and took me. But he said, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. You see? And we're going through a time right now where Satan has risen up. Yeah, it's their hour. It's the power of darkness. Don't let it discourage you. Keep on fighting the good fight of faith. We are called to this time, called to this hour. We need to rise to the occasion. God is with us. All will be well. But let's not hide our testimony. Let's declare the glory of God. He's in charge. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Walk in the Spirit of God. Let the Lord have the preeminence in your life. Now, this is so awesome because he said... I will put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds will I write them. The writing of God. The writing. God wrote something inside of you. Remember how Moses, when he was up there receiving the law, written on the two tablets of stone, Two tablets of stone. God wrote it. Don't ever take that stone for granted. God wrote on those two tables and gave it to Moses, said, here is the law. And Moses was coming down the mountain, and he noticed right away. God spoke to him, and he saw it. Remember, they heard dancing and singing 
Well, they heard a commotion, put it that way. Joshua was there with Moses, and Joshua said, I, there's a the sound of war in the camp. Well, we're up there, war broke out. And Moses said, no, that's not the sound of those that are overcome or of those that shout for the mastery. But the sound of singing do I hear. They're dancing naked around a golden calf. Look at the world today. The farther you get from God, the more clothes you throw off. And, you know, I can't believe some of the crazy things they're coming out with. Now they're saying that to save the planet, more people should be nudists because it takes energy to wash clothes. It takes all the phosphate and the detergents and all this stuff and all the energy expended from washing clothes and, all, and drying them and all that kind of stuff that the best thing is just most of the time don't wear them at all. Can you believe such a thing? You know, my parents would have never believed this. <laughs> Who would have thought it could get this crazy? I mean, we're hearing insane things all the time. And the, the really odd thing is there's so many people that say, yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. We should rise up with one voice of outrage, but these are strange times. But if you recall, and, and think about what that means, I don't hear anybody being overcome. They're not crying from being overcome. And they're not shouting for mastery. Look at the churches today. Look at the people. They've got the rock bands, the magicians, the ventriloquists, the nonsense going on. All the false doctrine and false concepts and philosophies. But they're not crying for being overcome. They're being overcome without a cry. Furthermore, they're not shouting for mastery. They're dancing around that golden calf. Remember, remember when Wall Street came tumbling down here last September? I remember walking from Whitehall over to Broadway with my wife and up Broadway back in 1995. We've been there 14 times, but this particular time was the first time, and we were walking up, and I noticed the big bull, big bronze bull. Did anybody ever see that? Yeah, that's right. It's right before you get to Wall Street. Kind of prophetic, too. Wall Street starts at a cemetery and ends in a river. Here they were. You know, I looked at that bull, though. I thought, yep, that's just like Israel, dancing around the golden calf, not shouting for mastery, not shouting for being overcome, dancing, singing, having a big wild time. There's your church world today. And Moses was so enraged by what he saw, he took the tables of stone and threw them down the writing of God and smashed them. They were broken. And of course, later on, he had to chisel them out himself, which he did. But the Bible says now God writes his law. puts his law into our hearts and writes his law in our mind. And the fact is, is now when he does that, you and I, when, when God does that, he's put his law into our hearts and minds, writing his law there. It isn't tables of stone that are broken anymore. But when you offend the Lord, if you slip up, if you fall into a sin, it isn't a table of stone anymore broken, but it breaks your heart. God breaks your heart. And that's good. Because when you're heartbroken, it's called conviction. Conviction. And God brings you to repentance because as a shepherd, he goes after the one that was lost. 
That's the kind of a God that we have. He welcomes home the prodigal son. No, he doesn't uh, have tables of stone that can be broken anymore. Now it's the heart that's broken. Because that's where his law is written. Oh.